Meeting will come to order. Um, the committee meets today to consider the nomination of David Norquist to be Deputy Secretary of Defense. Thank you for being here today. We also welcome any of your friends who are here. You can introduce those at the, at the proper time when you are recognized for an opening statement. In the meantime, we have the, the eight questions that have to be answered. Please answer these uh, in an audible way, if you would. Uh, have you adhered to the applicable laws and regulations governing conflicts of interest? Yes. Have you assumed any duties or taken any actions that would appear to resume the outcome of the confirmation process? No. Exercising our legislative oversight responsibility makes it important that this committee, its subcommittees, and other appropriate uh, committees of Congress receive testimony, briefings, reports, records, and other information from the executive branch on a timely basis. Do you agree, if confirmed, that to appear and testify before this committee when requested? Yes. Do you agree to provide records, documents, <laughs> electronic communications in a timely manner when uh, requested by this committee, its subcommittees, or other appropriate committees of Congress, and to consult with the requester regarding the basis of any good faith delay or denial in providing such records? Yes. Will you ensure that your staff complies with deadlines established by the committee in production of reports, records, and other information, including timely responding to hearing questions for the record? Yes. And will you cooperate in providing witnesses and briefers in response to the congressional request? Yes, Mr. And Chairman. And will those witnesses and briefers be protected from reprisal for the testimony or briefings? Yes. First of all, let me thank you. Let, let me uh, take the opportunity to commend the president for reaching a bipartisan budget a deal without one. Uh, all the work that we do here would be pretty much wasted, and I'm sure you'll have a lot to say about that during your remarks and responding to questions. Senator Reed and I, along with members of this committee, believe that we need confirmed leaders to guide the Department of Defense through the times of challenge and opportunity. The Senate just confirmed the uh, Defense Secretary yesterday, Secretary Esper, but uh, there are still 18 vacant civilian positions that require action. Uh, Mr. Norquist, you have been nominated to be the Deputy Secretary of Defense, where you will be uh, a key player for many critical decisions at DOD, from management issues to key policy questions. And uh, I'm sure you're up to the task. I shouldn't say what I'm about to say, but because uh, I've never done this before, but I'm probably the wrong one to uh, be chairing this hearing because I've already decided. And uh, I have strong feelings about you. In fact, I remember telling the president a long time ago, it doesn't matter who ends up being Secretary of Defense as long as you have Norquist in there. <laughs> anyway, for the past several years, the department has gone through several major institutional changes in an effort to reform how DOD does business. This includes elevating the chief management officer, the chief information officer, acquisition reform, including the splitting of AT and L, which you will have to be um, advising us of. And, uh, and one that you personally know very well, and that is the auditing. Mm -hmm. the, actually, auditing DOD after all these years. That's a novel thought. These changes are meant to make the department do its job better. But these reforms are far from being fully implemented. If you are confirmed, it will be your job to implement these reforms so that they meet congressional intent, making the department more efficient and effective. At the same time, you will be the key player in critical policy decisions. Your predecessor focused rightly so on the NDS. That's this report. We keep reminding people uh, that it's, uh, it's one of the better things we did around here. And uh, today we find ourselves in a new and different moment in American security. The American people can no longer take our military superior, uh, superiority for granted. China and Russia have passed us in a lot of key areas we have discussed in this table, as well as you and I in, the, in, in my office. Hard work remains. We need urgent change at a significant scale, and that requires hard choices about threat priorities, critical defense investments, and how the department itself is going to operate. This requires a strong deputy secretary of defense who understands the gravity of the situation, and I believe you're it. Uh, Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I join you in welcoming Secretary Norquist, and we look forward to his testimony. While Secretary Norquist's family could not be here this morning, I want to acknowledge his wife Stephanie and their children for their support of the nominee throughout his career. 
Secretary Norquist, you have been performing the duties of the Deputy Secretary of Defense for nearly seven months after having been confirmed as the Under Secretary of Defense Comptroller. As a Comptroller, you were the primary advisor of the Secretary of Defense on all budget and financial matters. Prior to your recent service in the Trump administration, you had extensive federal financial management experience in the private sector, the Department of Defense, and Congress. Mr. Norquist, if confirmed as the next sec Deputy Secretary of Defense, your background and expertise should serve you well as it has in your job at the moment. The Deputy Secretary of Defense is critical to our national security and the role is complementary to the Secretary of Defense. While the Secretary of Defense is often focused on external priorities that impact our global standing, such as establishing defense policy and maintaining alliance and partnerships, the Deputy is responsible for the internal management of the Department to include implementing policy decisions and ensuring the Pentagon runs effectively. Furthermore, the Deputy is often assigned a broad spectrum of responsibilities by the Secretary of Defense that requires strong management skills. When administering an agency as large and diverse as the Department of Defense, that is no easy feat. One of the most difficult decisions the Deputy Secretary of Defense must adjudicate is the allocation of budget resources. As the Department implements the National Defense Strategy, or NDS, it is vitally important that senior leaders consider the multitude of current and future challenges facing our nation when determining how to allocate resources for the development of weapons platforms and cutting-edge technology. This should be a straightforward endeavor. However, in practice, it is frequently complicated by two major factors service parochialism, and over the past decade, the Budget Control Act. During the annual budget review process, each military service is responsible for resourcing its programs of record and ensuring that they meet mission requirements. The deputy, on the other hand, is responsible for conducting a more holistic review of the budget. Specifically, the deputy should scrutinize investments across the services to ensure that they meet the intent of the NDS and that these programs are affordable and meeting performance metrics. If confirmed, it is likely that you will have to determine whether or not a specific military investment championed by a service aligns with the overarching priorities of the Department Secretary. Mr. Norquist, having performed the duties of the deputy the past several months, I hope you will provide this committee with your thoughts on how you intend to manage this process if you are confirmed. Compounding the problems of allocating budget resources is that the Department most currently, must currently at this time uh, adhere to the funding levels imposed by the Budget Control Act, but I join the Chairman in recognizing the pending agreement, which is quite a bit of progress. While the competition for resources within the Department is not a new phenomenon, it has been exacerbated by the BCA spending caps over the last several years. And again, I'm pleased to join the Chairman in recognizing that the Trump administration has reached a tentative budget agreement. Uh, it's a critical aspect of defense operations going forward. However, I believe that in order for the national defense strategy to be successful, we must ensure that the non-defense spending accounts are not shortchanged in order to increase spending for military. As the National Defense Strategy Commission, which was tasked by Congress to review the NDS, stated, comprehensive solutions to the co these comprehensive challenges will require whole of government and even whole of nation cooperation, extending far beyond DOD. Trade policy, science, technology, engineering, and math education, diplomatic statecraft, and other non-military tools will be critical. So will adequate support and funding for those elements of American power. In addition to these issues, if you are confirmed, you must also address the multiple civilian vacancies within the Department. As I stated during Secretary Esper's hearing, every member of this committee wants to ensure that high-caliber candidates serve in the Department, and we will continue to fully evaluate and expeditiously consider nominees for these positions. Secretary Norquist, we face many challenges that require strong leadership and the ability to make tough decisions. I am very confident you can make those tough decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Reid. Uh, Secretary Norquist, you are recognized for an opening statement. Um, it doesn't have to be too long because we have a lot of questions. We're going to mm -hmm. try to keep this uh, meeting continued. Not so right. you are recognized at this time. Thank you. Chairman Inhofe, Ranking Member Reid, and members of this committee, it is an honor to appear before you today as President Trump's nominee to be Deputy Secretary of Defense. I am humbled by the confidence that the President has shown in recommending me, and I thank this committee for its consideration of my nomination. My family would be here today, but this week is our annual family reunion. So instead, they are watching with their aunts, uncles, and cousins in California. Even in their absence, I would like to express my appreciation to my wife, Stephanie, for her love, her dedication to our family, and her willingness to support me in this endeavor, as well as my children, Warren, Elise, and Vivian. 
They are a constant reminder that the decisions we make today determine the America our families will live in tomorrow. I would also like to expect my appreciation for the men and women in uniform, the civilian workforce, and their families. We spend a lot of time talking about budgets, weapon systems, technologies, and doctrine. But our most important asset is our people. When the rubber meets the road, it all comes down to the individual men and women serving this nation, their bravery, courage, professionalism, sense of duty, and selflessness. Everything we do is about them and ensuring they have what they need to prevail. I began my career as a federal civil servant, a GS-9 program budget analyst working for the Department of the Army. Over the past 30 years, I've worked at multiple levels of the national security establishment, at a field site overseas, at a major command, at Army headquarters, on the staff of the House Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee on Defense, at the Department of Homeland Security as Chief Financial Officer, and three times within the Pentagon, including my current position as Under Secretary of Defense, Comptroller. Each of these positions had a common thread, protecting this nation's security while safeguarding the taxpayer's money. It is a profound responsibility, but I believe in this mission passionately. When I sat before you two years ago for my confirmation hearing for Under Secretary of Defense Comptroller, I made two pledges should I be confirmed. First, I promised that after years of sequestration that undermined the readiness of our military and delayed its modernization, I would work within the administration and with Congress to support robust defense budgets that fully supported our department's mission. Second, I pledged that after 24 years, the department would finally conduct a comprehensive financial statement audit. Over the last two years, in close partnership with Congress and this committee, the administration has proposed and Congress has supported robust defense budgets. And on November 15, 2018, the Department of Defense completed its first ever department-wide full-scope financial statement audit. This is a start, but there is more work to be done. The role of the Deputy Secretary of Defense is to support the Secretary in implementing his vision. Secretary Esper, like Secretaries Mattis and Shanahan before him, has made it clear that his vision is the national defense strategy, and that under his leadership, the Department will remain laser-focused on implementing it. Should I be confirmed as Deputy Secretary of Defense, I will work tirelessly with you to implement the NDS's three lines of effort, restoring readiness and modernizing key capabilities to build a more lethal force, strengthening alliances and attracting new partners, and reforming the department for greater performance, accountability, and affordability. These are challenging times, from the continuing threat of terrorism and the provocative actions of rogue states such as Iran and North Korea, to the return of great power competition. In addition, we now have two new warfighting domains, cyber and space, for which to build capabilities and doctrine, and new technologies such as artificial intelligence, hypersonics, and lasers, which promise to drive new concepts and ways of fighting. These dynamics create challenges and opportunities for us, but the last few years have demonstrated how much can be achieved with a clear vision and strong bipartisan support. I thank this committee for this consideration of my nomination, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Secretary Norquist. Uh, first of all, one of my priorities as chairman of this committee, and I think of the whole committee, it goes without saying we, we talked about this over and over again, is to use this as the blueprint of what this is all about, what we have been doing. In fact, it was uh, the, your predecessor, the former Deputy Secretary Shanahan, who played a leading role in putting this together. Now, I think you put it best, and this is your quote that you took out of this, uh, this document in describing the position that you'll be occupying. That is, quote, the deputy frames critical decisions for the Secretary of Defense on future programs and capabilities. Now, in crafting the department's fiscal year 2021 budget request, you'll have to make recommendations as to trade-offs between competing uh, competition, competing credibilities, competing capabilities. Uh, what you do to, to view these capabilities, there is a capability gap between us and China and Russia. I'd like to have you address this and what you plan to do to uh, correct this, uh, this gap. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. I think the key areas where the gap is most noticeable is in certain new technologies like hypersonics, artificial intelligence, and cyber threats. 
And so one of the challenges that's facing the department is even as we maintain readiness and the right force structure size, is to ensure that we are investing in those cutting edge technologies that not only are just advances to warfare, but may change dramatically the way warfare is fought, which requires an emphasis on experimentation and study, so we're positioned to win the next war, not just the last one. Mm -hmm. Okay, the uh, Defense Strategy Commission, uh, which is, was a bipartisan commission, there were 12 experts, 12 mm -hmm. Democrats, 12 Republicans, all of them recognized as, as experts. They put all this together and did a good job. The, uh, it states, quote, DOD lacks the analytical ability, expertise, and processes to link objectives to operational concepts to programs and, and resources. The uh, commission recommended that the DOD, and this is a quote from that, must rebuild de decision support capability to ensure that the secretary of, and the deputy secretary can make hard decisions grounded in serious analysis, particularly as they consider war fighting, fighting uh, return on investments. Uh, do you agree with this finding of recommendations and how do you plan to, to address these concerns? I do share their concerns. And in fact, when we submitted the 2020 budget, we added 32 million precisely to address the challenges analytical capabilities. When you look at what we're trying to do with new warfighting doctrine, new technologies, that puts a premium on the analytical capability to test, experiment, and study those to make sure we're making the right investments. Yeah, that's good. And then uh, lastly, a lot of people don't understand why it's significant that we have a two-year budget. Would you mm -hmm. describe that in your own words? So absolutely. At first, it, the, the agreement does, does right by the men and women in uniform, and it's more than the level of funding. The challenges that are created when you have CRs, threats of sequestration, the instability, this agreement puts us in the possibility of, having a C, of avoiding a CR, avoiding sequestration, and having two years of planning. So if you think of a unit that's preparing to do training, they don't know how much money they have for the year under a CR. So they potentially curl, cut back training with the understanding that maybe they'll get more money or less next year. But they'll never get October back. So whatever training they missed is a permanent loss. There are similar disruptions, and I can dive in further if others want to talk about oh. it, to depots, equipment, retraining. But it is incredibly valuable to the men and women of the military and to our future capabilities to be able to have this stability. Agreed. Uh, Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And again, Mr. Secretary, thank you. Um, as we discussed yesterday in my office, the Department has been, made very little progress implementing Section 911 of the 2017 NDAA. This is the key provision in the committee reforms to go order Nichols, and it requires the department to create course functional teams that could harness and integrate the expertise across the department's functional organizations. And if you're confirmed, can I have your commitment that you will ensure the department implements, as it should, the statutory requirements of Section 911? Absolutely. Thank you. And could you give us an update as soon as possible, perhaps even this week, about the status of the organizational strategy that was required by Section 911? I'd be happy to do so. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, we've referred to, both the Chairman and I, multiple times the national defense strategy. And at the core, it recognizes that Russia and China are employing all of nation strategies mm -hmm. to compete across all dimensions of power. Uh, and I'm concerned that we've done a lot with respect to high-end military capabilities and deterrence without equal attention and resources to integrating other elements of national power that stretch across many departments outside of, of the Department of Defense. What recommendation would you have so that you could be the catalyst for this whole-of-government approach? So I think there's a couple of things. One is we have to recognize that in, if we are successful in deterring the high-end fight that we aim to do, our adversaries will go into the gray zone. And the gray zone is partially the military, but it's the State Department, it's AID and other areas. And being able to work collectively with our, our other agencies as a whole of government approach to identify where we are vulnerable, whether cyber or others, where we can cooperate with partners and formal allies, that requires working across. And so I met with previous Deputy Secretaries of Defense and asked them what some of their advice would be. And one of them is, regular meetings with your counterparts. Your counterparts 
at uh, State Department as well as your counterparts at places like Veterans Affairs because there's a number of other operations. And so should I be confirmed, that would be one of the things I would put in place, that regular communication to help us build joint strategies. Very good. And uh, I think you make an excellent point is that when we um, have an edge at the high performance level of conflict, our adversaries will go down in the area where asymmetrically mm -hmm. they have advantages. And mm -hmm. so we have to build a capability, as you suggest. And I think the idea of meeting on a regular basis with this agenda is a very positive one. Uh, we have a, a situation here, as has been pointed out by both the, the, the German and many others, uh, of our overmatch in areas a decade ago was very clear. That overmatch has diminished. Uh, and you mentioned specific areas, hypersonics, AI, et cetera. Is there a specific investments in research that you could uh, advise us about today? Sure, there is a, there's a number of them. In fact, uh, the budget that was submitted, the biggest increase was in R&D across a, a range of technologies. On cyber, there's both the, the offensive and, and the defense because we have to protect our, not just our business systems, but our weapon systems, the defense industrial base, and then with Homeland Security, the critical infrastructure. And then you have to look at the missile ranges and the technologies, both uh, defensive as well as increasing our ability to work in what we call the anti access area denial environment that the Chinese are building along the, the first island chain. We have research technologies going on with hypersonics, with lasers, men and artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence one, I think, is different than the others in that its potential benefit is less clear. You know, you know what you're going to get when you feel the hypersonic missile, but artificial intelligence has a chance to, an opportunity to change a lot about how we use UAVs and other items. And that one it puts an emphasis on the analytical skills, on the researching, and on the prototyping. And this, uh, I think, raises the obvious question that we have to extend our cooperation outside the military laboratories and military contracts into academic institutions because that appears to be where the cutting edge work is being done on a lot of these topics. Is that correct? Correct. The, the, this is one of those areas where you see the private sector, the universities and others have a, a lot of information. And, and one of the things I talked about with some of the senators in preparation for this is when we strengthen our cybersecurity defense, we have to be careful we're not building a barrier to entry to small business firms. We have to ensure how to let them protect their data and still participate with the department. And as a final point, and uh, my time is diminishing, so this might be just for the comment. You know, one of the problems we have, too, and you, you alluded to it, the protection, is that uh, a major contractor has the resources typically to do elaborate protections. Mm -hmm. When you get down to the small business uh, in most of our communities that are providing significant quantities of material to defense contractors, they don't have that capacity. So I would like you to consider how we can collectively, working with the contractors, provide end-to-end -end cyber protections. Thank Absolutely, you, Senator. Senator, yeah. uh, Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Norquist. Thank you very much for being with us today. It was great to sit with you and visit uh, last week about a, a number of, of issues and concerns. But first, I want to say thank you so much for uh, working on the DOD audit. That was important to a number of us, and, and I'm glad that we were able to uh, get that started and, of, of course, see some great results coming out of that uh, with your continued attention to the various findings. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by addressing um, a DOD Inspector General report. It, it had stated that DOD has been paying out hundreds of millions of dollars in unearned bonuses or incentive fees to various contractors. And this, this does include $10.6 million that was awarded to a contractor that failed to provide necessary parts uh, that DOD was purchasing for F-35 fighter jets. And it's creating a life and safety concern for our airmen. And I think we all agree that that is unacceptable. So I have introduced a bill that would prohibit paying award fees 
uh, and bonuses to those contractors whose projects are behind schedule and over budget or whose performance is deemed unsatisfactory by the DOD. Uh, so would you work with me to, to end this practice that's really shortchanging our taxpayers and, of course, putting our soldiers, sailors, airmen, uh, and Marines at risk? Absolutely, Senator. And I appreciate that. And again, knowing your background and, and what you have had the previous experience in, I expected that answer. So thank you for, for that. I appreciate it. Um, one of the other cost-saving areas that we've looked at for DOD uh, centers on distribution centers. And the Pentagon has repeatedly, they have repeatedly asked Congress for the authority to streamline its distribution centers. Right now there are more than 250 of those. And the GAO says that this would save DOD more than $525 million over five years by reducing unnecessary overlap and duplication and more efficiently using the distribution centers. So DOD had developed an initiative to reduce the number of distribution centers, but unfortunately it was stopped in 2014 uh, before it was ever implemented. So um, what we'd like to do is, is further that initiative, and we would like to see some of those distribution centers uh, closed down or streamlined. Uh, can you also identify a few specific areas where DOD could make better use of the half a billion dollars uh, that we currently spend on those distribution centers? Absolutely, Senator. When you, when you do things like eliminate the, the extra distribution centers, you're not spending the money on the, the back end, the infrastructure. It allows you to invest either in, in additional readiness and training, getting units up to speed, get yourself a larger supply of, of spare parts to keep maintenance so your planes are flying, or to put the money to the new technologies we've talked about, preparing for the next generation. But it is much more valuable to have it in that area than to have it paying for distribution centers that are only half full or not otherwise mm -hmm. optimal. Absolutely unnecessary. So thank you. Um, I think we have seen with the, the recent budget proposal that uh, DOD certainly would appreciate finding those cost savings and, and using them in other areas. Um, so uh, one of the other bills that I've introduced is what we're, we're calling our Billion Dollar Boondoggle Act. And it would require that every department, including DOD, disclose to taxpayers ongoing projects that are $1 billion or more over budget or five years or more behind on scheduled completion. Uh, so, of course, uh, we would eliminate sensitive information. Anything that, that uh, is related to national security would be exempt. But uh, the Pentagon already reports some of this information to the congressional defense committees as required by um, Nunn McCurdy. But do you see any reason why the DOD should not make this information required to be disclosed by my bill available to our taxpayers? Senator, none that comes to mind. I'd be very happy to work with you on this issue. Should I be confirmed? I believe that driving those types of issues to the forefront so we can address them is essential to effective management. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any programs that might exist out there right now that are a billion dollars uh, over budget or five years behind schedule? None come to mind that are five years behind schedule, uh, but the ones that are over generally are either driven by requirements or by some other delays, but there, there may be some that fall into that category, mm -hmm. and I'd be happy and to work with you. Thank you, and certainly we would love to disclose that information. If there are valid reasons, we need to know that and understand mm -hmm. that, but we also need to be accountable to our taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, and I look forward to your confirmation. Thank, thank you, you, Senator. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Norquist, for um, your willingness to be considered for this critical post at this difficult time in really world events. I, I appreciated your willingness to come and sit down with me yesterday. And one of the things that we discussed was the challenge that our military installations are facing from PFAS contamination. It's affecting, as I'm sure you're aware, over 400 military installations. Um, and I was very pleased to see that one of the first things Secretary Esper did yesterday was to create a commission to address PFAS contamination, a task force, I think is what mm -hmm. he called it. Uh, and he noted that the key areas of focus for the task force are health aspects, cleanup standards and performance, science-supported standards for exposure and cleanup, interagency coordination, public 
Congress perceptions of DOD's efforts, and finally, finding and funding an effective substitute firefighting foam without PFAS. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could share with us how quickly DOD is hoping to accelerate research into finding a fluorine-free foam to substitute for PFAS. So first of all, I just want to say I uh, know that Secretary Esper is a very strong leader in this issue. I fully support both the initiative he's described as well as the priorities put on it. I think one of the, the points you make is the sooner we can get off of the existing system, the better. We can do things to contain it, but you really just want to replace it. Right. And so we will continue to look at what are the alternative paths for research. Are we putting enough money against it? Are we pursuing enough different solutions? And should I be confirmed? That's one of the things I would work with with the task force. Thank you. And do you have any sense of what the timetable is for trying to expedite research to find that new foam? I don't have that at this time, Senator. Um, and I hope that when you when you are confirmed and you get into your p new position that you'll be able to share with the committee mm -hmm. what that timetable might be. I think that would be very helpful to know. One of the other things that we discussed and you confirmed in your opening statement was the importance of cyber mm -hmm. efforts to protect the country both defensively and offensively. And I appreciated your quick response to my questions about the efforts to remove Kaspersky mm -hmm. software from the um, federal government and also from those companies that do business with the government. One of the things you pointed out in that response was that there are a number of additional classified steps that mm -hmm. DOD has taken. I look forward to having an opportunity to be briefed on those classified steps. Um, you also said that the Defense Intelligence Agency is developing a list of malign cyber actors and you expect to be able to share that list with Congress by August of this year, by mid-August of this year. Is that, um, can you confirm that that's the That's my that's understanding, correct, Senator. Um, thank you. The other thing that we talked about was the Women, Peace, and Security Act and mm -hmm. the importance of having women at the table in conflict situations, especially with respect to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and what we're seeing in Afghanistan. Um, can you confirm that you will do everything you can to work to ensure that that happens as we're looking at further peace negotiations in Afghanistan? Correct, Senator. We're working with the, the Ambassador Kalilzad as he does the negotiations, but you point out that's not just a side issue, it's a central issue, particularly with the challenges that the Taliban has brought when they were previously in control. Thank you. And as you point out, um, I had a, ch well, you point out the importance of ensuring that women are protected in any future situation in Afghanistan. I had a chance to visit there in April and heard directly from the women of Afghanistan their concerns about what might happen in any future peace negotiations and that they would be excluded from um, the ability to maintain the rights that they currently have under the Afghan constitution that was brought in after the fall of the Taliban. So, as you say, this is a critical issue to whatever happens there, and I appreciate your commitment to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know in uh, the chair's opening comments, he said that he almost didn't need to be here because he planned on supporting your nomination, as do I, but I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, one really relates to how you're using analytics to better manage and uh, reform, or I should say transform the department. So one of the issues that we've been able to benefit from with the audit is in order to be able to meet the audit, we have to have a much greater level and accuracy of the data. And so we've been ex developing data analytic tools that will let us to see not just summaries and totals, but individual transactions. And that was one of the biggest transitions from from that. That gives us additional information as we're managing and looking at maintenance issues, spare parts, supplies. You combine that with some artificial intelligence ability to do analysis, and we're seeing them make greater uses with regard to the maintenance levels of the F-18, and we're looking to do that across readiness and logistics as well. That's great. I'd, I'd like to learn more about that after your confirmation. Maybe I can come pay you a visit and get more of a detailed briefing on it that's in my wheelhouse. Uh, I also want to talk more about just general reforms. We had mm -hmm. Secretary Esper here and the work that he was doing when he was in charge of the Army, but can you tell me a little bit about progress you've made on uh, certain reforms since you've been in the current role and uh, what you think the priority, priorities are moving forward? 
Sure. So there's a number of reforms that, that we go on, and they start from things uh, as simple as simply scrubbing budgets. And so you go through line by line by contracts. We did that called the SSRB. Uh, that ended up with pulling out $470 million where we said, we don't need this, we can move on. Renegotiating contracts, there was a, a large contract for TRICARE. Didn't change the performance, but it changed who got to keep certain fees. That had a $600 million benefit. You take that all the way down to small stuff. Uh, you look at the warehouses for DLA where they shifted to print on demand. We had a warehouse that had 130 million physical maps in case we needed them. And that took up 180,000 square feet. Well, we can now shift to print on demand. That freed up that square footage to be used for other purposes. You have those, and then you have some of the larger ones. You have the healthcare transformation that the MTFs that the Congress directed. You have the migration of the background uh, investigations coming over to DOD. We've drawn the backlog there by 260,000 cases down. But as you talked about data analytics, being able to use that to do continuous monitoring. So instead of waiting five years and then having somebody do gumshoe searches over somebody's past five years, we can track over the course of the year if there's an issue with finances, an issue with the police or others that allow us to act more promptly and then uh, clear cases more quickly that are, that are low risk. So a lot of interesting and useful stuff to go on, but a lot more to be done. Yeah, going back to that point that you used about print on demand, some people would, uh, when they're looking at all the big rocks, they wouldn't take time to turn over these little rocks that in, in uh, combination, they, they result in a lot of efficiency and a lot of savings. So I really commend you for looking across the spectrum and going after the, uh, the quick hits as you can find them. The last question I have for you relates to the NDS and any advice you would get as we move through um, the, uh, the appropriations process. It looks like we're going to have a, a deal that at least gets us into the discussion of appropriations. Any, any comments you would have on priorities with respect to appropriations? So I think with regard to the appropriation process, first, we appreciate the ability and the opportunity to have the bills enacted on time. When that happened last year, that was tremendously helpful. We want to protect readiness. We want to make sure we take care of the men and women. And then looking at those future investments that position us not for the fight of today, but the fight of the future. Those research areas, they're often not the largest dollar amounts, but they're the critical ones in terms of laying the groundwork for the future. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to supporting your nomination. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Norquist. Uh, first of all, for your, uh, uh, for your willingness to serve and your uh, record of serving, and I appreciate it very much, and also your priorities with your family. I think they should have stayed also, <laughs> and I appreciate that very much. You and I talked briefly. You were a busy, busy person yesterday. You met with quite a few of us, and I had a nice visit, and I appreciate that very much, and we talked a little bit about this. To explain to the American people, and especially I need to explain to the people back in West Virginia, one of the most patriotic states in the nation, mm -hmm. but still yet they have fiscal responsibilities and they have fiscal concerns and questions. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the only uh, uh, threats that we face as a nation, exponential th th threats, is from mm -hmm. two countries, China and Russia. Mm -hmm. So when you look to uh, well, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, defense since 1960, the following are the defense expenditures that they have. I think they're a year old or so. But the U.S. Spend, spent $649 billion. We're over 730 this year, I think, in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Uh, China was at 250, okay. We were at 3.2% of GDP. China was at 1.9% of their GDP. And then Russia spent 61 billion. If you put Russia and China together, they're not quite half of what we spend totally. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at how we explain our bang for our buck, and I guess you might want to explain also, uh, you and I talked about all the contractors. We have more contractors in Department of Defense or working with or for the Department of Defense than we do have men and women in uniform. Mm -hmm. We won't explain that, and it doesn't look like it's cost effective, and I have a hard time understanding it. And when you look at the personnel, uh, the United States, we have 1.3 million active, mm -hmm. uh, 816 reserve. Uh, aircraft, and you look all the way down the line, China has 2.2 2. million active, 510 in reserve, and Russia has 1 million active, 2.5 million in reserve. So when we look at all of the things that are changing and how do we uh, assess uh, China's threat to us and also how do we ath assess Russia's threat, short term and long term? So I think when you look at China and Russia short term and long term, you're looking at two countries headed in very different directions. And therefore, they have very different approaches. The, the Russian economy, the Russian uh, is, uh, is struggling. And so therefore, they are more likely to be 
aggressive or provocative in the near term as they see a, a darker long term. The Chinese are in a very different position. The Chinese generally have a more optimistic view of where they're growing. Their economy is, is close to the size of ours, if not headed in that direction. There are some demographic issues they will face, but they can afford to be more patient. But it also means the investments they make now. So they've been, while well, their numbers for defense are lower, they're growing at a much, increasing at a much faster rate as they anticipate uh, what's coming in the future. So I think the challenges we face in each of those countries is very different. And the, you know, one's predominantly a land-based conflict should it occur, and the deterrence is heavily based around ground forces, and the other is a Pacific sea-based uh, environment requiring a very different mix of capabilities to effectively you deter. Want to, you want to maybe go into the money that we're spending? Because when you look at uh, China's coming on quick as far as matching us mm -hmm. in uh, equipment-wise. Aircraft, we have 2.3 thousand uh, mm -hmm. aircraft, 2.8 thousand uh, attack, uh, 2.3 fighters, uh, 1.2 transport, 5.8 thousand helicopters. Uh, we have 6.2 thousand tanks and ships. We have 24 carriers, 68 submarines, 68 destroyers, and 22 frigates. China uh, has 1.2 thousand fighters, 1.6 thousand attack, 193 transports, and 1 uh, thousand uh, helicopters. Uh, tanks, they have 13 thousand tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at ships, they have uh, one carrier, but 76 submarines. 33 destroyers and 52 frigates. Right. They're doing all this on a budget 250, 250 billion versus our 700. Right. So there's a couple of factors at play here, all of which are important. One of the first ones is the difference in, in what's called purchasing power parity in economics, which is when you look at the cost of the goods, the labor prices, what you can buy is different in each area. That affects it in some areas. We, for example, have a volunteer force. We think it's better to have a volunteer force and we, we pay the cost of it. The other is the nature of warfare, which is, as we saw, you know, example in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the force with the slightly better uh, technology, the slightly better equipment often has a very lopsided victory. And so where other countries often in, engage in volumes of lower quality, we buy the, the more expensive, but the one that is likely to prevail. The risk here with China is whether you can maintain that technology edge over time, and if you can't, that's a very difficult place to be. And one final thing, very quickly. We have our, uh, our guard and our reserve mm -hmm. that have a lot of expertise, a lot of skill sets, but we're still spending a tremendous amount on contractors, mm -hmm. which I believe we already have them on the payroll with our guard and our, uh, and, and our reserves. That doesn't make sense by well, you do not using that more effectively and efficiently cost-wise. So, Senator, you and I talked about one particular yeah. example, which is cybersecurity. And one of right. the opportunities we have is, even though it's challenging to retain them in government, with somebody in the Guard Reserve, they're already in the private sector. They're already using that skill on a day-to-day -day job. We're taking advantage of that, and we need to be able to look at ways to do more of that. Thank you very much, sir. Look forward to voting for you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First Secretary Norquist, I, I want to thank you and your family for your career and your service to our country. And everything that you've been doing over the last two years, I think you've made a difference. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the efficiencies and the challenges we have in the acquisitions process, and in particular some things that, and as a nation, we should expect our armed forces to be pretty good at. Mm -hmm. and that is, is um, a December of 2018 GAO report outlined how the DOD shortages in uh, skilled personnel have delayed depot maintenance on critical weapon systems. This is not just one particular branch of government, but I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Uh, the USS Boise, uh, which is a nuclear attack submarine, sat at dry dock. It actually sat at port waiting to get into dry dock. It's going to have been out of service for six years before it's operational again. Mm -hmm. We've got three more nuclear attack submarines that are in a similar type position today waiting for the ability to actually get in and, and to be put back into operational service. It's not just the Navy, uh, even though another example would be the FA-18 and the Hornets that we've got right now that started out at probably less than 40 percent actually being mm -hmm. mission capable. My understanding is, is we've made some progress closing in perhaps on the high 60s, but nonetheless our expectation is over 80 percent mm -hmm. mission capable. But they're old aircraft. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we've got an F-35, which is a brand new aircraft, state-of-the-art, mm -hmm. critical long-term and should be in force between now and the year, perhaps the year 2040. Mm -hmm. And yet today we're finding that even with this brand new aircraft, 
we've got issues. Uh, just as an example, another GAO report found that from May to November in 2018, once again, so this is up to date or mm -hmm. fairly up to date, the F-35 aircraft were unable to fly nearly 30% of the time due to spare parts shortages, coupled with a repair backlog of 4,300 parts. Uh, this the, 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 the long-term planning that we've laid out have an expectation of 80% mission capable. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we going to do and how do we cut through what uh, clearly is a problem in just the very basics of being able to repair the equipment we've already got on hand, regardless of its age, but to get spare parts and to be able to, in a reasonable fashion, make repairs on the equipment we've got and to get the personnel in place that have the competencies to do so. So, Senator, I think there are four things that really have to come together, and every one of them helps drive the solution. First of all, is, as we talked about, is the stability with the budget. In many of those cases where we had a moment of sequestration or CR, a ship missed its availability going into depot. And then once that happened, it, it was no longer in line, and for it to move in, another ship got bumped, and that starts to cascade. Frequent deployments have a, can have a similar disruptive effect, and so the stability of bringing the budget on time, being able to know that we get the ships, that's helpful, but then you still got the issue of spare parts. Are you buying the right ones? Are you getting them out of production? One of the things we're looking at is the use of artificial intelligence and others to be able to do better predictions on what we need. In some cases, we're either dealing with very old aircraft and a diminishing supply, and we see the risk we have sometimes with some vendors where the cost of those parts can go up dramatically. So being able to either maintain the rights to those license, to be able to do it with uh, 3D printing or with the, those types of things to be able to solve those. Those are all pieces of it. One of the points you talked about is people. The Air Force was short 4,000 maintainers. They've recruited them, but now those are 4,000 maintainers with one to two years of experience. A few years from now, they'll have five to seven and we'll be in a much stronger place. So part of this is when you turn around from a, a deep cut in the budget, or says, there are some time it takes to fix. But this is a multi-level problem, and we have to attack every single element of it to be successful. And this is what I want to, well, I want to get into for just the remaining minute that I've got. Mm -hmm. You've got a GBSD, in which we have proposed that we will implement that will replace the Minuteman 3. Can you talk about how serious it is that we keep the GBSD, the replacement for the Minuteman 3, a critical part of the triad, absolutely on target with regard to the NDAA direction and also the appropriations process here, and what the implications are to the triad if we don't stay on an appropriate timeline. We're not just talking about F-22s here. We're talking about a significant part of the nuclear triad. Could you share a little bit with, with us on that? The nuclear triad is the foundation of our security. When we do things internally in the building on the budget, the answer is you will fully fund this before you submit us the rest of your budget. Our concern is that previous decisions over many administrations delayed action on these, and we have run out of time. We have run out of the ability to push things a year or to stretch out. For every leg of the triad, we need to be very persistent about staying on schedule, keeping the right funding levels, and so I would encourage folks to remember this is the foundation, and when we're trying to deter people towards the gray zone, the first thing is you want to be able to just clear that you can have an effective nuclear deterrent. So I think it's a foundational item. It's very important that we have it fully funded and be able to move forward with the, what has held the peace for so many years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of Chairman Inhofe, let me recognize Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Norquist, welcome. Um, the DEPSEC DEF is essentially the department's chief operating officer, and mm -hmm. I'd like to be reassured that you will uh, uh, be able to perform that very critical role in making sure that the trains run on time. Um, specifically, in terms of strengthening our transportation and logistics systems, mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think it's a foundational step in pre uh, for us in terms of uh, great power competition. Mm -hmm. Do I have your commitment that if confirmed, you will make sure that OSC aggressively and continually pushes each service branch to prioritize logistics planning and infrastructure investments by forcing leadership to demonstrate in detail how they would actually project and sustain power in real-world conditions of contested environments? Absolutely. Thank you for that response. Could you also elaborate on how Congress could enhance the capabilities and uh, capacity of transcom or just infrastructure investment levels in general to help the department achieve this goal? So I think when you look at the, the resources that transcom provides, we always want to have an away fight, which means we need airlift and sea lift and those capabilities to get there. Making sure we have those at the right level and making sure that transcom has the 
the resources to deploy them is essential. I know there are different studies done it on a regular basis to look at this, but it's one of the areas where you have to be able to, to meet that. And in a high-end fight, you also have to do that with the expectation there's going to be some level of attrition. We are used to deploying forces overseas and being certain that they will arrive at their destination. World War II, that was not the case. We have to be prepared for future conflict where there are submarines and other things out there. And so you have to have enough lift to be able to accomplish that. Thank you. Last week, you and I discussed the subject of authorizations for use of military force, including the limits on the legal authority provided under the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs. Do you believe that the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs provide legal authority for the United States Armed Forces to execute a preemptive military strike against Iran? So my, I agree with Secretary Esper who, when he answered this question before, 2001 is, is aimed at uh, counterterrorism. Uh, my understanding is it does not apply to, to Iran. What about 2002? The 2002, I think, is specific to Iraq. Okay, thank you. I don't think there's anybody in this committee who would question the authority of the United States Armed Forces to take immediate action in response to a direct military attack. Mm -hmm. However, I do have questions about the limitations surrounding this principle. In your view, if a proxy force of Iran launched an attack that targeted our military personnel, military platforms, or harmed an American, whether in uniform or a civilian, would such an attack provide the department with legal authority to wage war in, against Iran without congressional action, without limits on duration, and without limits on scope and scale? And we're talking about proxy uh, um, forces. So, Senator, I don't want to, to signal to others about how much they, damage they can do what, but generally okay. we have rules that require a proportionate response, and so if I can happy to meet with you offline if, if you need more clarification than that. But I believe the uh, Article 2, the requirement relates to proportionate response. Okay. I would appreciate that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, as you know, the Army has been working to prioritize rapid innovation by standing up the new Army Futures Command. And I want to make sure that we are also adequately protecting our long-term manufacturing and innovation needs. If confirmed, will you commit to taking concrete steps to encourage the services to be thinking about ways that they can use our existing manufacturing and innovation resources, American-based resources? It would include, for example, the great talent at Rock Island Army Arsenal and the groundbreaking research being conducted at Fermilab and Argonne. Absolutely, Senator. Thank you. Um, as the department CFO, you ushered the department through its first audit, mm -hmm. and I congratulate you on that. Um, I say that it's successful even if it was not passing, because I think we can agree that without a baseline of some sort of reliable data, it is almost impossible to do the sophisticated and analytics we need to, in order to eventually get to a clean audit. Mm -hmm. When you and I sat down last week, a couple of areas we highlighted that would benefit from more focus were IT, security, and oversight of contractors. What are some of your major takeaways from the first audit? And if confirmed, what lessons will you expect to incorporate into your new position of essentially the department's chief operating officer? So we found in the audit that the primary issues showed up in three areas. One is IT, business systems, IT security, password changes, those types of things. The second was the accuracy of real property, and the third is inventory. And in inventory, one of the areas that was a particular challenge was inventory held by contractors. And so in each one of these, the value of the audit is it comes back every year. So not only will we have people executing corrective action plans to close this, each year we'll get a report card on how we are doing, and we have set up uh, tools allow us to track that, to report back to Congress across the organizations in defense, who's able to close what findings and what are the areas they're success on. But the value of that to the military, to have an accurate count of inventory, you know, one of the cases we had is NAS Naval Air Station Jacksonville found 70 to 80 million dollars worth of parts that people had acquired and put on the shelf but weren't in the inventory system. And so they had to fix like an amnesty day, those came out. Well, those were in demand parts. Those are planes and ships and things that needed it. And so that was quickly uh, consumed by the organization and save the taxpayers that money. So we want to encourage that. We want to drive more of that. But those are the areas that we see as the most uh, immediate areas that need attention. Thank you. And I look forward to supporting you. Thank you, Senator. You're back. Senator Blackburn. Thank you and welcome. We're glad you're here and appreciate the time that you gave me last week to review some things and talk about the audit and then to be able to drill down on a couple of issues. I want to circle back to uh, something we discussed with 5G mm -hmm. and looking at foreign production and adoption of advanced communication technology such as 5G wireless networks and how this is going to challenge our competitiveness and our data security. Uh, U.S. data will increasingly 
flow across foreign produced equipment and foreign controlled networks, raising the risk of foreign access and denial of service. And just this month, the Philippines 5G rollout began. It's a Chinese design network executed by Chinese engineers in the Philippines, backed by state-owned China Telecom Corporation on hardware supplied by Huawei. The Philippines are a vital U.S. security ally in the Indo-Pacific from joint exercises and training to stabilization in the South China Sea to coordinated humanitarian relief. Meanwhile, Huawei's equipment is up and running in the 5G networks of another regional defense partner, South Korea. It is spreading through Europe and the Gulf and is the bedrock of Africa's telecom mm -hmm. network. In your advanced policy questionnaire and in our discussion, you indicated that next generation information communications technology, 5G, is an area in which DOD plans to collaborate with the private sector. And I would like for you to expand on that statement. And if you're confirmed, how would you prioritize this collaboration? So one of the ways that, uh, Senator, that we're looking to work with the private sector is to give them environments where 5G can be established, like on a military base, at a depot, because part of what they need to do is be able to experiment. And often it's hard to get an entire city or town to agree to let you to put this equipment up. So we can put them up on bases, bring in the private sector and say, here's what the network has. What can you do with it? How can we take advantage of it? How can we develop both military and, and private sector uses of it to experiment and develop? Because that's part of what gives the competitive edge in that area. We're also looking at dynamically sharing spectrum, which allows uh, to give a competitive edge in 5G as well. So those are some of the areas that we're working right now uh, with the private sector. And, and should I be confirmed, it'd be one of the areas we'd continue to focus on. Well, then go ahead and touch on how you would collaborate with them with artificial intelligence and with hypersonics. Sure. So with, uh, with artificial intelligence, there's a number of activities that go on in the private sector that have an overlap with the government, such as uh, in logistics, we're working with them. There's the Jake has a project that they're doing, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, working with the private sector on disaster relief. How quickly can I use video and identify people in a disaster area so that I know how to rescue them and using the data and the power of artificial intelligence to find that in a video faster than a, a human can. So we're going to continue to use the, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center to establish more of those pilots and experiment and expand the range of areas where that cooperation occurs. I was uh, just in Commerce Committee and we were passing out the Broadband Data Act and mm -hmm. the 5G Leadership Act, which we had amended with a portion uh, or a portion of that bill was amended with my uh, Supply Chain Security mm -hmm. Act, something that I think is vitally important. And we know that DOD partnering with the commercial sector is going to be um, of mm -hmm. tremendous importance to moving us forward mm -hmm. with artificial intelligence, machi machine learning, etc. cetera. Um, quickly on cyber, let's, um, we've talked a little bit about Russia and China and their engagement in massive cyber campaigns and trying to steal trade secrets and proprietary information. So uh, just to touch on this with Russia and China's aggressiveness and their massive thefts of technology and cyberspace and touch on the threat you think that presents to our security and our economic prosperity equally. It is a very serious threat, and it works across a, a range of areas because they can come into the critical infrastructure of the private sector. They can go after those defense firms and the defense industrial base. They can go after government ones either to go in and do malicious attacks to disrupt our activities or simply to steal technology so they can advance through theft what they couldn't advance through research. That undermines the safety and security of our forces in future fights. It undermines the uh, copyrighted protected data you know, that vendors depend on for their businesses and losing that proprietary information puts their competitive edge at risk as well. We look forward to having you move through quickly, and I thank you for being here today. Thank you, Senator. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A meteoric rise. Uh, 
Uh, Secretary Norquist, first, uh, as you know, the last year's National Defense Act created the National Cyber Solarium Commission, of which you have been a participant. Uh, I hope you will continue to be engaged in that process because I think it's very important to try to develop a coherent strategy for this country. Absolutely, Senator. Thank you. Uh, I want to follow up on some of the questions of, of uh, uh, Senator Rounds about maintenance. Uh, and he mentioned, or I think you mentioned, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. uh, who owns the design? In other words, if we buy an airplane and there's a, there's a bolt in the wing, who owns that? Can, can we, do we get, as a routine matter of our contracting, the, the design that we could use? We could have our own 3D printers print that part and keep the airplane flying? So the challenge is you only get what you put in the contract. And if at the time you did the contract, you did not record that, protect that, give yourself the rights to it after a certain period of time, you run the risk that the vendor decides it's no longer profitable, make it, and all of a sudden it goes into misuse. Don't, don't you believe in, in the, in the, as the ascendancy of 3D printing, this would be a good thing to have oh, in our contract? Absolutely. This is one of the areas where, should I be confirmed, we would want to, to work with the Congress on ensuring, because one of the places we've seen uh, future injuries with vendors is these these parts that are we don't have the rights to them no one has the the ability to produce them we either can't get them or they're unbelievably expensive correct so uh, i would hope that future contracts would have as a routine boilerplate provision the rights to the design that we're paying a lot of money for right. We, we need to make sure that we protect those rights for those parts so that later on in life when we have a valuable $100 million piece of equipment, we're not tied up over a $5 bolt because we can't use it. Got it. I, I think that's very important. I appreciate that. Again, on the question of maintenance, and this mm -hmm. is sort of the general question, I think you, you get this, but maintenance, it seems to me, is the low-hanging fruit of readiness. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can have an airplane that's ready 80% of the time instead of 60% of the time, you save money on procurement, you save, you save time, you save readiness. I, I really think maintenance is an area that deserves a really substantial amount of attention uh, in the Navy, the Air Force, the Army. Mm -hmm. uh, my sense is that we have a lot of equipment that's not used and useful right now because of failures of the maintenance system. Mm. So the maintenance is a, is a big challenge. It's one of those areas that's less glamorous, but people who work in it understand it's essential for everything else. Things don't fly, things don't sail without the right maintenance. And the amount of time and energy, you can focus on the cost line, but the amount of time and energy of lost capability is significant as, as well, lost training, lost other things. So ensuring that we have the right pipeline of parts, ensuring that things are moving through maintenance in order to be able to have the higher readiness rates is absolutely essential. And I think we might have something to learn from the private sector here in terms of uh, the airline, the commercial airline fleet has a very high level of, of, of readiness as compared with the military. And I, I just hope that there can be some, some cross discussions there with the private sector. Same thing goes with the commercial shipping uh, compared with, uh, with the Navy. So I commend mm -hmm. that to you. I think you realize that, as you say, it's unglamorous but I think there's a lot of money to be saved and an increase in the overall le uh, level of readiness. Uh, a different topic. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the chairman mentioned in his opening, there are now some 16, I've heard various 16, 17, or 18 civilian, top civilian, mm -hmm. civilian positions empty in the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. I hope you will do everything in your power along with newly minted Secretary Esper to deal with that. We need top leadership at the Pentagon. Right. Should, uh, should I be confirmed with Secretary Esper, putting the team in place as quickly and as early as possible so that you have them for the, you know, the duration is absolutely essential. I know that's his high priority, and I look forward, should I be confirmed, with working him to make that happen. I would hope that there would be a specific plan, okay, here are these positions, work with the White House, because uh, we, we, it's, it's too important to not have uh, the top leadership in place. Well, there is a plan, and there's a list of the positions, and there's a list of the, the candidates and where they are in the process of either getting the background investigation, the clearance, the vetting. So that is underway. That's something that is uh, routinely meet. There's meetings on that to make sure that keeps moving. And you can be assured that this committee will move with alacrity uh, once the nominations are forwarded to us. We appreciate the speed with this. This committee has moved. Secretary Esper's nomination was fantastic. Thank that, you. That was a land speed, modern land <laughs> speed record, I think, and, a, and I think a good decision. Uh, just a final comment. Mm -hmm. You're the father of the audit. Don't take your eye off it. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to have a lot of other responsibilities, but this is one of the most important, again, it's not very glamorous, but one of the most important uh, missions that the department has. It's important to us to be able to reassure our citizens, our constituents, people of Maine in my case, that we're 
paying attention to where the money is going and that we have a handle on it. So please don't lose focus on the audit. Uh, as I say, you have other responsibilities, if, but be sure there's somebody that you have directly working with you who's following that closely and uh, it, it would be too easy to let it slide. So, Zena, you have my assurance, absolutely. As the chief, as the deputy is the chief operating officer, they are the user of the types of things that come out of the audit. But I should say in fairness, the amount of people who are involved in the audit, the congressional support, I'm happy to be called the father, but there's a whole lot of other parents in this community driving that process, and a lot of good people in the department who've been able to make those changes possible, and I appreciate their work. Success has many fathers. Failure is always an orphan. If it doesn't go well to be, I'll be very lonely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank uh, you, Senator. and uh, I look forward to your uh, nomination. Senator Perdue. Well, I um, certainly look forward to voting for you. I am excited that uh, you're uh, willing to do this. I want to echo what uh, the former governor just mentioned uh, about the audit. I want to congratulate you on the first audit in the history of the United States uh, on our defense uh, spending. Uh, since 1990, we had the law that required every president to do it, and yet this president was the first one that required it, and you executed it as CFO. And I want to congratulate and thank you on that and echo what um, um, Senator King just mentioned about staying on point, and I know you will. Um, I've got a question. For, before I get into these two points, though, uh, I want to uh, echo what you just said in answer to uh, Senator um, Manchin's question about the demand issue. I think we all know that spending $738 billion is a big expense. We spend another $200 billion on our, on our veterans. Mm -hmm. But in a world that's more dangerous than any time in my lifetime, I can't see any way around that, neither can President Trump. But I want to, I want to ensure, assure the American people something. I'd like to echo what you said, that China right now, if you adjust what they're spending for purchasing power parity and bring in other accounts that they don't talk about in terms of their R&D and all that they do through their civilian and commercial enterprises, they're spending about the same as we are right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've done this in the last decade when we disinvested our military by 25 percent. It's the third time in the last 50 years that we've had presidents dis disinvest in the military, and every time we saw other actors around the world become nefarious, and that's what we see this time. Specifically, this week, there are reports that China has signed a secret agreement allowing its armed forces to use a Cambodian Navy base. Beijing works to boost its ability to project military power around the region. This is on top of what they've already done to militarize the South China Sea, what they did in foreclosing that port south of Colombo and Sri Lanka, what they did uh, in foreclosing on that port in Karachi, what they've done with 36 ports with proprietary loans in Africa and 51 ports around South America. Um, Mr. Secretary, what, what do we do in this uh, environment? What do you plan to do as the COO with Secretary Esper and our military leadership in uniform to stand up to this um, growing threat? We're making the transition from dealing with terrorists for the last 20 years to now dealing with near-peer threats that are accelerating while we're trying to get going again. Right. So the challenge is you've got countries like China who engaged in predatory lending to their neighbors, setting up debt traps, who are occupying territory that the international community recognizes does not belong to them, militarizing it despite their promises not to do so, and then dramatically ramping up their investments and their spending in defense. That creates a, a broad range of challenges. And so at the one level, you have to put forward the force to deter them to keep them from going to, to a conflict, to keep them on the peaceful side. But then you've got to work in the, the gray zone and buy with and through your allies to make sure people in the region are reassured and not feeling intimidated or, or drawn into those challenges. One of the things you talked about on defense is probably worth highlighting is uh, defense spending right now is somewhere around 3.1, 3% of GDP. 2010, it was 4.5%. Back in the Reagan era, it was 5.7%. So one of the unspoken stories is defense is a smaller and smaller share of our economy. Now, part of that is because we have a growing economy, which is a wonderful thing, but as a foundational expense to protect everything else, this is a smaller and smaller down payment, and I think that's an essential thing for people to keep in mind, even though the numbers are low. Would large. you also agree, sir, that's a great point, that our allies need to stand up and shoulder a little bit more of the responsibility of this global peace that we've enjoyed for the last 75 years? Absolutely. I believe that the NDS, and the chairman does this every time, and I echo this, the NDS that, has, that was produced um, by uh, Secretary Mattis when he was there uh, and, and the team is one of the best documents that I've seen in my experience up here. It looks to me like in there there are three success factors, though. One is consistent funding, and we are working hard. That's on our side of the ledger. 
Uh, I, I'm less concerned about the actual dollar amount than I am the fact that we can depend on it for another two years. Mm -hmm. If we get the appropriation process done, and I, I'm confident we'll do that, we will now have three years in a row, first time in a decade, that we've been able to start the year without a continuing resolution. Mm -hmm. We've done it 186 times over the last 45 years. This military and our supply chain has become seduced to the fact or, or, or hindered by the fact that we have uh, handcuffed them in terms of consistent funding. So that's the first success factor. Mm -hmm. Second one is the supply chain. The supply chain right now is anemic. We have disinvested it. It is withered. We've got to rebuild it. It's not going to happen overnight. I'm talking about shipyards, maintenance depots, uh, vendors, R&D capability, et cetera. The third and the most, and this is my question, personnel, the human factor. It's always the limiting uh, issue, and it's also the big difference between us and the rest of the world. We're the innovators. We're the capital formation uh, experts. But we have to train and recruit 270,000 roughly. You mentioned this yesterday, mm -hmm. 270,000 people a year into our military. That's huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the equivalent of many Fortune 20 companies, and, and we have to do that every year in a voluntary environment. Our, our uh, near-peer competitors don't have a voluntary force. Mm -hmm. We are also carrying overhead with our veterans of about $200 billion a year. In that environment, as COO, how do, we, how do you propose that we continue to be competitive uh, in that environment, particularly on the personnel front? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things you have to do is you have to, to combine things. One is you have to give a competitive wage. You have to be able to draw people in uh, to a lifestyle that, that, that and a, a form of living that is that financially is not a, a tremendous sacrifice. But the answer is you're never going to be able to solve it completely that way. You, you're not going to. So you need to have a mission that draws them in. You have to have a community that takes care of them. You have to be careful about how often you deploy. You have to be careful about shutdowns and CRs and the disruption so that they would recognize that in the sacrifice they're making for service and the risks they're taking are being matched by the commitment to support them. And then, as you pointed out, is the training. The, the advantage of this volunteer force is their skill set, and if they're properly trained, there's nothing like it in the world. But each, genera each year is coming in another wave of people, a quarter million or more, and you've, you have to maintain that level of training, or three years in, you've got a significant problem that will take you years to dig out of. Right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask the following two questions, initial questions of every nominee who comes before any of my five committees. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or, or assault of a sexual nature? No. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement relating to this kind of conduct? No. I, too, was um, taken with the, the idea of using 3D printers mm -hmm. for uh, spare parts, and I think uh, the, the, I think it's very good that we put something in the contract so that we are able to reproduce these parts. But I'm wondering whether they, uh, uh, there is an issue relating to counterfeit parts. Mm -hmm. And what do you do regarding ferreting out counterfeit parts? And, and uh, is that a big problem for the Department of Defense? So it hasn't been brought to my attention as a problem, in part because in general you know who the supplier is. But depending on where you're buying those part from, if you're buying it on an open market where you're not buying it directly from the producer, then you could potentially have the risk of getting a counterfeit part through a reseller. And that's something you have to be very attentive to. Off the top of my head, I don't know the controls we put on that, but I would suspect it's in the contracting process. I hope so. And, and you talked about how important um, uh, maintenance is. And so what we do finally have a shipyard modernization plan, and I'd like your commitment to make sure that that plan proceeds. I've, it's a very important funding. issue. I'm happy to work with you and support it. Yesterday in the Energy Committee, we had a hearing on our compacts with the freely associated states, Palau, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands. And I'd like to have your uh, commitment on the record regarding your assessment of the importance of these compacts to our national security. They are very important to our national security. The, the islands, the location, the, the people in them, and so forth, it put the presence in the Pacific matters, and we need to maintain close and productive relations with those communities. And of course, if we don't do that, China will move in, because they are very active in so many other areas in, in the Pacific. Correct. Okay. Uh, sexual assault across the U.S. military increased by a rate of nearly 38% in 2018, according to a report released by the Pentagon earlier this year. And a recent survey of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy found that almost half of all female cadets, about one in eight women, reported experiencing unwanted sexual contact. So basically, the, 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 um, this is a continuing scourge on our military. 
And we have heard military and civilian nominees come before this committee and say they will do this or that to help fix the situation, and yet, uh, including recent service academy data shows otherwise. Uh, what are the biggest obstacles to stopping sexual assault in the military, and what do you plan to do if confirmed as Deputy Defense Secretary to improve the situation? Sure. So to start with, sexual assault is a violation of a person's most basic rights. It yes. has no place in the military or in our society. One of the things that we noted you know, in the trend was you saw it about 10 years of the numbers, the incidents going down, the reporting going up in the right direction, and then the most recent trend went the wrong direction. And it seemed to be predominantly concentrated in the youngest demographic of 17 to 24. It raises the question of whether the techniques we have used in the past are working with the next generation or whether we have to take a different approach. Secretary Shanahan, when he was in the position, put together a task force with a series of recommendations, including things such as creating a separate item in the criminal code for the US, uh, UCMJ, as well as what we call uh, the catch, which is allows people to privately and restricted report. And then if they're told that other people are filing reports against the same person, then they may be willing to come forward because they realize they're not alone and as part of a group. Many of these are in the NDAA for that the Senate has put forward and we're very supportive. So one of the first things that I would do, should I be confirmed, is to oversee the implementation of those recommendations in order to try and address this issue. And of course, as with anything, uh, you noted yourself that if we're not doing the right thing, using the appropriate mechanisms, then it's just not going to work. So your assessment of what we're doing and what we're not doing would be a continual uh, concern. Let me turn to uh, climate change. A critical factor affecting military readiness is the changing climate. Rising water levels are beginning to impact shorelines. Islands are beginning to be overrun by sea levels more and more frequently. Hundred-year storms are appearing, the effects of which can impact the overall preparedness of the joint forces as well as humanitarian efforts in the countries around the world. And is the impact of climate change a concern to you? It, the military has the challenge. We have to operate in, in desert in the Arctic. And so mm -hmm. each one of these issues in the climate, and you know, one of the, the things I believe the, the senator from last year is not here at the moment, but the opening of the northern passage and what that means to trade routes and other types of issues uh, is a significant issue. So yes, it's something we follow. I'm most concerned about our ability to, to operate in the range of environments that our forces have to yeah, operate I'm, in. I'm going to want to ask you to respond maybe in, in writing as to what you plan to do because the Department of Defense is one of the few departments that even acknowledges that uh, uh, climate change issues has an impact on our national security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, is that it? <laughs> no, okay. Mr. Chairman. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Make, let, excuse me. Let me make an announcement here. We got three votes that are going on now, David. You're aware of that, I'm sure. So people will be coming in and out. But I do want people to know, the members to know, that we're not going to wait around to after they vote three times. We're going to go ahead and close this thing down. So you're recognized, Senator Hawley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ed, can we talk a little bit about the department's work on the blunt layer in the global operating model as laid out in the NDS? Mm -hmm. I'm curious what investments you think we need to make to prioritize or we need to prioritize in order to effectively blunt a Chinese fait accompli against Taiwan. So I think when you look at the blunt layer, what you're talking about is a layer that's operating close to or inside the Chinese anti-axis environment, an area where the other side will have a sufficient quantity of, of a high volume of ballistic missiles and others. And so what you have to look at is investments that allow you to survive in that environment, the ability to move and relocate so that you, they can't be certain as to where to target, environments that allow you to, su to survive for long periods of time without long logistics tails because you're quite forward, uh, things that let you uh, be able to detect and defend and to hide yourself. And so those are some of the areas that the forward-laying force most has to emphasize for survival. Uh, what about uh, INF range uh, missiles? Would you support the deployment of those in order to help blunt the Chinese attack? Any potential so Chinese attack? The bulk of the missiles the Chinese have, those conventional ones, since they're not restricted by the INF, fall into that category. When you look at the range of the Pacific, this is not a discussion, by the way, of, of nuclear missiles, which was the right. intent of the INF. These are conventional missiles. But the answer is those ranges in the Pacific 
are exactly what the, the range of all the combats are. That's the distance from islands to islands. That's the type of range. So those types of technologies are essential to being able to operate in that theater. What uh, sort of enablers do you think we'll need to invest in to make that kind of a missile layer operable, workable, successful? So you need to invest in the different stages of the technology from the, the booster to the deployment, the ability to make them preferably uh, mobile. I think some of this I'd prefer to, if we want to dive into in a classified environment, but there's a series of investments that I think are appropriate, many, most of which are in our budget, but some will come in future budgets. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, let's talk for a second about allies and partners. Mm -hmm. Senator Perdue started to touch on this uh, at the, towards the end of his questioning. There has been uh, some progress, I think, uh, with our allies in terms of our collective security. But thinking about NATO in particular, mm -hmm. where would you like to see our European allies contribute more? And how might the department work to help them get there? So I think when you look at the contribution of the allies, first of all, we want them to live up to their agreements to be able to spend at least 2% of GDP. You know, this is an alliance. We're not there to subsidize people. We're not there to profit off them. We want them to be able to do their share and make sure they, su they support their forces. Depending on the country, I mean, some of the countries, the answer is based on their location. It's ground forces. It's the ability to do strikes against uh, surface air missiles and others. They're further back. It's more reconnaissance, surveillance. It's maybe sea power. But each one of them has uh, an area where they can particularly con contribute as part of the overall effort. Um, thank you. That's, that's very good. L let me ask you about it. DOD has regularly been forced to use sort of high-end forces like aircraft carriers and scarce missile defense batteries to counter relatively uh, low-end threats. And I'm just wondering, how do we think about, as we go forward here, how do we fix this mismatch? I mean, what investments does DOD need to make or continue making so we can deal with lower-end threats uh, threats that the NDS, for instance, ranks as lower priorities in a cost-effective way. Not ignore them, deal with them, but in a cost-effective way. So there's a number of things that we have, have looked at in order to deal with it. One is the platform, you know, there's a light attack aircraft. The other is certain technologies like lasers may allow you to address certain ones more efficiently. And I think, as you point out, in the long run, there's a cost imposition question, which is, are you spending more money to destroy the other item coming in? Now, to some extent, you spend what is necessary to protect the lives of the people being attacked, and so the cost is not the cost of the defense, it's the cost of what you're protecting. But in the long run, you need to have a less expensive way of destroying the enemy's threat without otherwise financially you're on the losing end of that deal. What role does nuclear modernization play here? So nuclear modernization is a foundation, right? You have to have a strong nuclear deterrent. You, need to, you don't want to ever have any doubt about our capability or capacity uh, inside, when we have the guidance, the answer is you will fully fund, um, because this is such a priority to make sure that we know we have that capability. Including LYBMs, I mean, that's an important aspect of that, you would say. Is that fair, is that fair to say? Yes. Um, last question for you. The uh, NDS uh, Commission report uh, recommended that defense spending should, should grow at a 3 to 5 percent of the rate above inflation, which I know you're very familiar with. Uh, the budget deal that's recently been announced uh, does not hit that threshold. So after spending two years as the comptroller, what, what are the hard choices that the department is going to have to make in order to reconcile the new top line with the urgent need to implement uh, NDS priorities? So at the end of the day, you're balancing between the size of the current force, the, the readiness and the investment in new technologies. And so you want to make sure you do that right and you have to make trade-offs in that space. And I understand the importance of both security and solvency and, the, and why people reach this and not everyone gets everything they want out of the deal. The one thing I'd highlight, though, is the value of that stability of the deal to our ability to be able to uh, deploy the forces. If we went just under... You know, we spent nine years that we started with the CR, some of them lasting so long that the cumulative effect was equivalent of three years. But you can't do a new start under a CR. So the new technologies you want to invest in, even if you later get an appropriation bill, you've lost six months. You know, you have people who are not effectively spending the money. They spent six months holding it back. And then even if you got the same amount later, you've now got six months to spend it. So I think the stability has a value for the department and for the families and the workforce that I don't think should be underestimated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to ask you uh, a couple of questions about the UTC Raytheon merger. As you know, uh, I'm not sure what his title is right now, uh, Dr. Esper mm -hmm. has said he is going to recuse himself from any involvement in that merger. What do you expect yours will be? So this would be something I believe that's handled through the Undersecretary for Acquisition. 
They would take a look at the uh, risks to the industrial base, the ability to support competition, what it means for existing programs. Then they would either bring up a recommendation, I'd, I don't remember which level the decision is made, but it'd be worked with Under Secretary Ellen Lord and myself as to whether or not uh, there are any concerns. Assuming I'm confirmed, that would be the, the path going forward. And what do you view as the potential concerns? So one of the things you look at, and it's not just this, it's any, it's any merger, which is, do I have the two vendors who are selling the same product <clears throat> who normally bid against each other merging, so now I'm only going to have one bidder left? That would be a problem. So that's where you're looking for a loss of competition. You're looking for whether there's going to be a disruption to an existing acquisition program that one or the other is managing. Those are some of the primary concerns. And are you concerned generally about the trend toward consolidation in the defense industry, the numbers of defense contractors has diminished very substantially over the last decade or so. It has, and I'd have to look over time, and I haven't seen the, the data on what the consequences of, of that has been. I mean, there are certain areas where those types of combinations can be very valuable, and in other areas where you risk losing the competition. And so I wasn't familiar with each of the, the cases as they came up before, but it's an area where you want to keep an eye on it over the long term to make sure you're not putting yourself in a place where you have fewer and fewer suppliers. And uh, in terms of the timing, what do you view as the potential timing for either uh, Under Secretary Lord or yourself or both of you being involved? Senator, I'm not familiar with the, the timeline that that process goes through, but if you'd be happy to, I can, I can reach out to Ellen Lord and get you that answer for the record. I would appreciate that. On Monday, um, I met with uh, Secretary Esper, and he committed to recuse himself, and then he did in... Mm -hmm his testimony here. Um, and so I think this merger raises some very significant policy mm -hmm. implications, both positive and, as you point out, concerns about the effects of mm -hmm. the consolidation trend generally. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like uh, an outline from you uh, as to the kinds of considerations and criteria that will come into play when you consider it, uh, because I think they set an important framework for mm -hmm. broader issues facing the defense industry. The trend toward consolidation is likely to continue, for better or worse, and the Department of Defense ultimately is the consumer here. In most mm -hmm. mergers, the consumers are ordinary folks who go mm -hmm. to the supermarket or retail stores or the internet to buy. But here, the major consumer is the Department of Defense in many respects. So I think we need to protect that consumer. That's our job and yours. And I would appreciate your considering it. Uh, I uh, was interested in uh, the testimony from Secretary Esper. I guess he's been sworn in, so yes, I Senator, apologize he has. Uh, that, I, that I didn't know his title before. Uh, Secretary Esper uh, discussed the long-term strategic threat posed by China mm -hmm. and the need to maintain our undersea capability, in fact, expand and enhance it. Correct. Uh, do you agree? Absolutely. One of, the, one of the things that survives in an anti-access environment is the undersea capability, particularly submarines. And that's important not only for the triad and the new Columbia class, but also Virginia attack class correct. submarines, correct. correct? And the Virginia payload module is important to achieve in as many of those submarines as possible. The Virginia payload module is a tremendous addition to the Virginia class submarine, and the capacity it provides is incredibly valuable, particularly the high-end fight and particularly when you're operating inside that anti-access environment. And I hope that you'll continue to support the robust plans that this committee and the Department of Defense have joined in, in achieving and leading. Absolutely, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator McSally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Norquist, good to see you. It was great to visit with you last week to talk about a number of issues 
Um, I want to highlight a few here today in my short time. Uh, Luke Air Force Base in Arizona trains 70% of the world's F-35 pilots. Uh, we need these fifth generation fighters to make sure that we continue to dominate in the air, uh, have not just air superiority, mm -hmm. uh, but air dominance. Uh, I'm concerned about the, the readiness uh, issues that were already brought up about uh, the GAO report saying 30% of the fleet was unable to fly and uh, that they will not make the 80% readiness goal uh, by the end of the year. So I know uh, Secretary Esper talked about this a little bit. Uh, part of it is the canopies. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us any sort of update on uh, the path forward in order to improve the readiness of this important asset? So I think that uh, the, the canopies is one of them, and that's an area where the solution on it works is just decays so fast that you end up taking it down and replacing it. And so the answer is you, as you field a new system, you find things like that, and you're like, okay, we got to go with a different solution. We need things that don't drive ongoing maintenance deals. There have been a series of... You know, and Secretary Shanahan would host these meetings where they'd go over each of the individual drivers that kept uh, readiness down, what the short-term solution, and more importantly, what the long-term solution was so that the sustainment costs and the readiness numbers stay up in the long run. So those are some of the things that are underway now, and I expect that we will... Uh, continue to need to work that as we go forward. Great. I also want to highlight to you, uh, manpower is an issue, as, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, back when I flew, uh, you'd have you know the crew chief who has your the basic maintenance of aircraft, but then you'd have the specialists that are all uniquely the hydraulics guy, the avionics guy. Mm -hmm. They have a innovative program at Luke Air Force Base. They're calling a lightning integrated technician, mm -hmm. where uh, they're basically cross training across many core competencies, a smaller team that actually owns the airplane. Mm -hmm. And what they're finding is it's taking less manpower, uh, the aircraft are more available, and it's actually increasing morale and pride because they own the aircraft, mm -hmm. and they're able to be more utility infielders for keeping that mm -hmm. jet available. So you're an efficiency guy. Uh, this seems like a really great example, and I would just ask if you would take a look at it to see where, across all the services, initiatives like this mm -hmm. uh, could help uh, basically increase our readiness while decreasing manpower and increasing efficiency. Absolutely. Be happy to look at that best practice and make sure it gets widely shared. They really are a model there, and I'm really proud of what they're doing, and I hope to host you there to be able to see it firsthand. Uh, and the other issue we have as a modernization as a priority is the training and testing ranges. Mm -hmm. So we've got the Barry Gold, Goldwater ranges out there, which are amazing, and I, mm -hmm. I trained my squadron there myself. Uh, but with the fifth generation aircraft, they don't quite have the size and the emitters for realistic training. Uh, we also have the Yuma Proving Grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're doing more long-range capabilities in the Army, long-range strike, they got to shut down a highway in order to test anything longer than uh, 60 kilometers. And then we also have uh, the electronic proving grounds at Fort Huachuca. Again, these are amazing capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, but they are not fully modernized to make sure that we're taking advantage what, of what they have so that we can test and train uh, for future warfare. So can you commit to partnering with us uh, to specifically address the training and testing ranges to make sure that Again, our military has everything they need, and they're training like they fight, and we're modernizing those ranges. Absolutely, Senator. The threat keeps changing, and you have to modernize our ranges to represent the more modern threat, and otherwise, otherwise you're preparing the, the pilots for the wrong environment. And so those types of investments are a key part of effective training and effective development of the force, and I, I fully agree with you and be happy to look at that. Great, fantastic. Again, I look forward to hosting you there so you can mm -hmm. see uh, these training and testing ranges we have, but they, mm -hmm. they also need, uh, need to be modernized. Uh, finally, I'm grateful for the partnership we've already had related to stopping sexual assault in our military. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, and I saw in your answers to questions, you're going to be overseeing the implementation of uh, many of the task force's recommendations, mm -hmm. the one that I, I asked to be created uh, to improve the process after an assault is reported through the investigation and the judicial process. Will you commit to continue to work with me on the front end of making sure that we stop assaults in the first place now? We've got way more to do. Uh, zero assaults needs to be the goal, and we've got to figure out a better way for prevention, especially with our younger soldiers, sail sailors, airmen, and Marines in that age 17 to 24, what really works. Don't just Good. throw more training and PowerPoint slides at them. Let's figure out what's actually going to work in order to stop this crime from happening in our ranks. <laughs> I'm absolutely committed to working with you on that, Senator. I believe both the importance of the, the prevention, but as you have brought up in other cases, the ability to support the survivors with the right process and the right information as they go through this so they're not uh, left out of the loop as to where things are going and what's happening. Wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate uh, working with you on this as well and look forward to supporting you uh, in your confirmation and working with you in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Norquist. Congratulations. I think you're going to do a fine job here. I look forward to 
supporting your nomination. I want to follow up a little bit on this discussion of allies. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I uh, actually had an opportunity to meet with uh, Ambassador Bolt when he's heading over to the Asia Pacific mm -hmm. this weekend when he's stopping in Alaska. And, um, you know, we're undertaking host nation support agreements with different countries. Um, I certainly support the President's uh, view of getting more, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, from our allies in terms of home basing. I think that's fair. But let me ask one question. Um, nobody's expecting this, but if for some reason, you know, at the end of the day, there was no agreement, we had to pull out our forces from Japan and Korea, um, what would be the strategic implications for the United States? Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? It would be a very bad thing. And let me ask, who, who do you think would be celebrating? Um, who, what countries, well, I'll just ask you, haven't Russia and China, North Korea been trying to splinter our alliances in the Asia Pacific for decades and would think this is a wonderful thing if somehow we left the, those areas? They would. The one thing we have that they don't have is a network of allies and partners. People want to work with us. They're not particularly excited to work with them and being able to maintain that constructive relationship. So we should able. be looking at deepening and expanding that alliance group. You're right. Uh, we are an ally-rich nation. Those countries are ally-poor. Mm -hmm. They pretty much just have each other, and nobody else wants to be on the China team, for example, right. unless they're forced, right. bludgeoned. Um, let me ask, uh, I, I want to commend you on the audit. I think we're working with the chairman and his staff uh, and you on a hearing soon, whether the full committee or the readiness subcommittee, which mm -hmm. I chair, I think it would be a great opportunity to highlight in more detail the good work that you do. We can learn a lot from that. Um, I want to talk just briefly on missile defense. You mm -hmm. know, um, the, I was at the Pentagon when the president rolled out the missile defense review with the vice president mm -hmm. and the secretary of defense. There's been a lot of progress, bipartisan progress, on this mm -hmm. committee. You know, my state, Alaska, is the cornerstone of America's missile defense, whether mm -hmm. the missile fields or the radar sites, all of which we're building up. Anything else that you think needs to be highlighted uh, from the Missile Defense Review Act that we should be focused on here uh, in the Congress to make sure we have the most robust missile defense for our nation? So I think, Senator, I, having, I went up and traveled to Greeley. I think the, the forces we have up there are fantastic. The location there, the number of different trajectories for which that provides deterrence is incredibly valuable. I think the one thing that we have to continue to do is, is research and experiment. We have to continue to uh, look at the evolving threats and look at the defenses and make sure we are keeping up with those challenges. Well, let us know. Uh, again, part of the, I've had uh, bills three, uh, three years in a row that have become part of the broader NDAA that talk a lot about testing, a lot about mm -hmm. the importance of broad-based testing for our, our missile defense. But it is a good news story, bipartisan good news story that you don't hear a lot about in the press, but we're making significant progress, and um, it's, a, it's a good a partnership between the Pentagon and the Congress on that. You know, uh, I'd love to get your commitment to come back to Alaska. I, I, I will say it again. You know, General Billy Mitchell called it the most strategic place in the world, given our strategic location. We're going to have, by the end of next year, over 105th generation fighters, F-22s, F-35s, located in Alaska. Um, but we have 50-year-old tankers in Alaska, these KC-135s. Um, when I had Secretary Esper here just last week in his confirmation hearing, he said the message it would send to our potential adversaries, China, Russia, North Korea, uh, to have 105th generation combat coded fighters and uh, stationing KC 46s in Alaska w would send a message that the U.S. has, quote, extreme strategic reach. Mm -hmm. That's the new Secretary of Defense said that just last week. Would you agree with that? I, I absolutely agree with Secretary Esper. One of the things I always tell people is if you want to understand the reach of Alaska, look at a globe turn around and you'll be impressed with what falls within the range of aircraft or aircraft with additional refueling. Well, I look forward to getting you up to Alaska again and having you um, take a look at this issue on the KC-46. I think it's a no-brainer when the uh, Air Force does its OCONUS uh, deployment decisions, but um, having your support, the secretaries, the chairmans, uh, I think is important. Let me ask a final question. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be appropriate to me not to mention the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've showed this slide to you and many mm -hmm. others. It's just the last couple, last about two months of headlines mm -hmm. with regard to things that are happening in the Arctic. China, Russia move into the Arctic, put U.S. at risk. That's the Hill newspaper. 
China military expanded reach into the Arctic, Pentagon says. That's Bloomberg. I mean, on and on and on. I, I do think that the Pentagon, uh, in some ways, is the last to kind of recognize the strategic importance of the Arctic, both in terms of opening sea lanes with receding sea ice, natural resources. Secretary Pompeo gave a really powerful speech mm -hmm. on our strategic <laughs> interests there. If confirmed, which you will be, uh, will you commit to work with me and this committee, which has done a lot on highlighting the importance of the Arctic for our military and national security interests, will you can uh, commit to doing that with me and other members of this committee? Senator, should I be confirmed, I'd be very happy to do that with you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Senator, and he'll be up to uh, Susie leaves Oklahoma. Now, <laughs> we do want to get one last thing on here, and that is the questions for the record. We're going to have a deadline of today, and we would ask that you would respond to those questions of the record as soon as you receive them. If you do that, it's been a great hearing. Appreciate all your efforts. Look forward to working with you. We're adjourned. Thank you.